Hi, welcome to the video lecture on chapter six, where we are going to cover the American criminal justice system on cops or police. But since we're covering the three prong system of cops, courts, and corrections, I'm going to call them cops. All right, so again, whenever there is something that is specifically going to be on the quiz or an exam, I will make sure that I let you know to specifically pay attention to it. Okay, so what careers are available in the commissioned or sworn policing field? So first of all, what is a commissioned or sworn employee? So whenever somebody says that they are commissioned or sworn, that means that that person has gone through, been hired, gone through the hiring process in their state um, and with a law enforcement agency and gone through a um, academy. We normally call them a police academy, but it's really a law enforcement academy and been certified through the state as a police or sworn, generally we'd like to say commissioned or sworn um, position to carry not only a firearm, but they also have arresting powers. So everybody normally says that that is a police officer, but it's really not only just police officers. For example, when I went through my um, academy, there was also a firefighter um, that went through because they were going to be an arson investigator. And so not only were they going to um, be able to carry a firearm, but they were going to be able to write citations and they were going to have arresting powers if somebody um, committed the crime of arson or anything in that field as well. So in Oregon, for example, there's only um, one academy and it's the DPSST in Salem and there is a body that governs that and they oversee what the training is. So when you hear people say, oh, we wanna change the training that is required for law enforcement, that's the body that oversees what training is required and what training um, new officers get and also what is required to keep the certification of being commissioned or sworn. So for example, right now I'm retired. I can, can't can just go say, oh, I wanna be a, a law enforcement officer anymore because I'm not currently trained. You have to keep current certifications such as your firearm training. There's certain certifications you have to have quarterly. There's certain annual certifications. There's certain um, certifications you have to have. When you go through the academy, there's weekly um, tests you have to take, there's defensive tactics training, there's um, tests you have to take that you have to have knowledge that you know certain laws. Um, so there's a whole bunch of training and there's so many hours. When I went through, I think it was almost 700 hours of training that I had to have. Um, so there's a lot of different training that you have to have and those training is again set by the state. Um, in Nevada, where I went through, was set by post police officers standards and training. That's generally what the state's called. Every state kind of has a different um, naming for it, and it has an acronym. But like I said, in Oregon, it's called DPSST. So if you were to have a question on a quiz that said, what's the difference between a commissioned or sworn employee or a non-commissioned or civilian employee, you would say, well, a commissioned or sworn employee is someone that has been through a academy and that has powers given to them by the state of arresting powers that can arrest somebody and that carries a firearm. All right, so are all those in law enforcement referred to as a police officer? No. So. I was called a police officer because I worked for a city or municipality. I worked for the city of North Las Vegas. But if you have somebody that works for the county, so for example, locally, um, the county is Jackson County. So if you live in Ashland or you live in Talent or you live in Medford, you live in Jackson County. So if somebody works in the county and they work for Jackson County Sheriff's Office, they're a deputy. Or if somebody works 
for the state and they work for Oregon State Police, that person is a trooper. Or if somebody works for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, that person is a agent. So know the difference. You will see that on a quiz and you'll know that they're all different and they all have different uniforms, which we'll talk about in a minute. So now again, these aren't always totally consistent. This is just a guide. But if you look in the upper left under figure 2.6, um, police officers with municipalities, um, this is a little different. You see the light blue uniform. Most of your city police departments wear dark blue uniforms. Ever so often you'll see that light blue top, but most of your city police departments will wear a dark blue uniform. My um, uniform was dark blue. Our short sleeve uniforms and our long sleeve uniforms were dark blue tops and dark blue pants. Um, now, ever so often, if you have a special detail, like when I was on our problem solving unit, we had gray uniforms and you'll see your SWAT units will have different colored uniforms and your canine units might be different colored uniforms. So those are special units. So those are always going to be different colored uniforms. But for the most part, your city um, municipalities are going to be, be a dark navy blue uniform. And ever so often, the reason I put that figure 2.6 is ever so often I have seen municipalities wear a light blue top. All right, figure 2.6, sheriff deputies. Um, they wear a combination of a tan, dark brown, and navy forest green. So I've seen some counties and sheriff's department wear only um, your dark brown. I've seen them wear tan and dark brown. And then I've also seen them wear dark brown, tan, and forest that dark green. So it kind of just depends on the sheriff's office. All right, figure 2.8 state troopers. Now most of them wear, wear a navy um, blue like your city municipalities like I did when I was a um, city police officer. However, um, ever so often you will see them wear um, uniforms such as your sheriffs, your counties do. And I'll give you a good example. Um, California Highway Patrol. That is um, a state trooper, California Highway Patrol, kind of like Oregon State Police. However, they do not wear dark blue uniforms. They wear brown uniforms. So ever so often, again, you will see a difference. All right, and then finally, your federal agents. Those um, bottom picture, you can see they have FBI and they kind of were wearing camouflage. Um, they don't wear uniforms, they wear business suits. They mostly sit at a desk um, in business uniforms, or sorry, business suits, unless they're serving a warrant, which they normally do leave to your agencies, whether it be your departments, one of the above departments that you see the pictures of, um, but for the most part, they're in business suits. All right, so federal law enforcement. All too often, I will hear, um, when I'm in class, I will go around the room and I will hear students say, I'm majoring in criminal justice and I want to go be a FBI agent or CIA agent or marshal, or I want to go um, be in the Secret Service. And I will always refer that student back to um, the website of um, the federal law enforcement agency and look at their educational requirements because the skills generally for federal law enforcement are a bachelor's degree. If you go look at most of your law enforcement agencies for municipalities, um, for your um, county agencies, a lot of them do not, in fact, less than 1% require a bachelor's degree. It's not until you get into management that your agencies, your law enforcement agencies require you to have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. 
But federal law enforcement do require upon entry that you have a bachelor's degree. However, if you do have your major in criminal justice, they also require three years full-time work as an investigator, which means generally you're looking at being not only a law enforcement officer, but to be an investigator, they want you to be a detective. So obviously you do not enter um, law enforcement as a detective, um, and generally it takes at least two to five years minimum before you are going to be a detective. So, you know, you're looking at a, a while before you're gonna start applying to be a federal law enforcement officer if you're gonna get a bachelor's degree with a major in criminal justice. So, to be a federal law enforcement officer, they like degrees in computer science or in foreign languages um, or in the other sciences, in your STEMs um, areas. So, I always say make sure you check which federal law enforcement you want to go into. Um, for example, CIA, for those students that have um, grown up speaking another language other than English, oh wow, that's amazing, especially if you want to get another major in a foreign language, that is amazing career to go into, especially with the benefits they start out and what they start out making. So. Great careers, but definitely check in the majors because criminal justice is not one of the majors that they're looking at unless you want to start um, in law enforcement as a detective. All right, state law enforcement. Um, they are generally responsible for traffic enforcement along the highways and interstates. Some state agencies are responsible for general investigative duties such as Oregon state police. Um, they are overseen by a superintendent appointed by the governor and again they're called trooper and they wear blue uniforms with the round tipped hat. Ever so often you'll see them in brown or tan uniforms like California Highway Patrol as I already explained. Your county law enforcement are your sheriffs. Um, your sheriff is elected so for example I'll use locally in Oregon. Um, your Jackson County Sheriff's department, the sheriff is elected by the people. There are 3,142 counties in the United States, that's not going to change, that have sheriff's offices, that have sheriffs that are elected, that run for office. Municipal police departments, that's your city police department, so lo I'll start locally. I worked for a city police department in, in Las Vegas um, for a city police. We actually had our own jail. Generally, the jails are attached to your counties, but we had our own jail with cities, which is an unheard of. Um, you work for a chief, and the chief is not elected. The chief is hired by the city manager and the mayor. So the mayor is the boss of the chief of police. So you may see that in a quiz. I may say, who hires the sheriff? And you're gonna say they are hired by the people, they're elected, whereas the chief of police is hired by the city manager and the mayor, where the mayor is their belief, their chief, their boss. I can't talk today. Um, the city police officers wear navy blue uniforms. All right, there's a lot of other kind of officers. Everybody always forgets about all the other kind of officers that are out there. There's tribal police officers, there's university police officers. Um, and don't get confused, there's different types of university police officers. Um, for example, um, where I, depending where you go to school, right now the Southern Oregon University, um, there are what we call civilian um, campus security officers, which means they're not commissioned. You guys know what commissioned officers are, right? Because we just learned that, which means they didn't go through a um, police academy. Um, they are not commissioned. They don't have arresting powers. They don't carry a gun. But that's not true for all universities. For example, um, other universities do have commissioned officers that do go through um, 
police academies and they are commissioned officers that carry guns and do have arresting power. So it just depends on the university. Generally, it depends how big they are. It depends on a lot of different things. Um, there's corrections um, and they're, they are commissioned officers. Now, they're not the same type of commission, meaning um, they don't go through the same length of academy. They are definitely commissioned where they're correction commissioned um, for being working in jails or prisons. Um, so, and they're amazing. A lot of times their um, contracts are only sometimes within a dollar an hour less than what a police officer makes. In fact, I've had them come and speak to my classes and a lot of them say, you know, I, I started out wanting to be a police officer and I tested for both and I became a correction officer or some departments will have um, them work at the correction jail first before they can be a police officer and they say, you know, we only make 50 cents less than an hour or a dollar less an hour and my backup is seconds away instead of minutes away like the police officers are and I love my job and I was going to be a police officer but now it's so much, I, I love it. It's like I said, my backup seconds away and I love it. So for those of you interested in law enforcement, you might want to check out corrections instead. Um, there's also, um, we've talked about the difference between jail and prisons, and there's also work in prisons. We've talked about the difference because it is different being a correctional worker instead of being working in the prisons. And so there's also that kind of work. So that brings up all other kind of job opportunities. There's also parole and probation officers or working, we call, locally we call those community justice workers and having clients. Um, locally, you have to have a bachelor's degree, and so that's an amazing type of work. Um, and locally, we have an amazing director. You go through a modified academy as well. You're a different type of commissioned officer, and our director locally uh, says, hey, you can carry a firearm or not. And so that's an amazing opportunity as well. So all kinds of various different types of law enforcement officers. There's also conservation police officer, federal game wardens, state game wardens, gaming control agents, school police officers, school resource officers. Some of them are commissioned, some of them aren't. And now that you know the difference, it just again opens all those amazing opportunities. All right, so is there jurisdictional overlap and, and what is that? Um, it's huge, I, I have to tell you. I never um, knew what that was until I went into law enforcement. And I have to say when you get to a call for service and after you find out if everybody is okay safety-wise and medically, um, that's the next thing you ask is whose jurisdiction is it? Because that decides who investigates the crime as far as their detectives after the initial law enforcement officer arrives. It also decides what court and what prosecutors and what lawyers are gonna work the crime. So it's huge, it, resources are huge. So jurisdictional overlap is really, really big and it's a huge question that is asked um, as far as what goes on. All right, so we've already talked about you know, you know what commissioned means and you know about the academy and you know about state um, and overseeing the training and certifying to arrest and carrying a firearm. And we talked about all the jobs that are out there um, available in the commission world. Well, what's out there in the civilian world as far as in that kind of cop field in the American justice field? Well, there's a lot. So let's kind of go and talk about those. Um, there's a lot of what we call commissioned work in the park police area, but there's also a lot of park police that are civilianized. In fact, locally, for example, in Ashland, um, Ashland police in the summer hires park police officers that are civilians that do not have to go through an academy that are not commissioned officers that don't carry guns that, that do not um, have arresting powers. There's also community service officers. You know, I get asked a lot of times, 
you know, why we don't have police like in London that that are civilians. And we actually do a lot of our police departments, many of them, in fact, most of them have what we call community service officers that are civilians that do not carry guns, that respond to our nonviolent service calls. It, so if we have calls for service that are just report calls that aren't violent, we are serving, we are calling out what we call our CSOs, our community service officers that do not carry guns and that do not have arresting powers. We also have reserve or auxiliary officers that are oftentimes uh, retired officers. Again, I um, could be a reserve or auxiliary officer that, that I don't have arresting powers, I don't carry a gun because I'm not keeping up with all of those certifications and so I wouldn't be commissioned. Um, we have cadets or explorers that are in training. They're, they're not commissioned, they're not carrying a gun and they don't have all those certifications. So they are civilian positions and, and we also have what are called volunteers. All right, we also have a huge social service component to law enforcement. And those careers are in public service and they're generally provided by the government or nonprofit organizations. And they're in the, the areas of housing assistance or subsidies or food assistance and health care because officers go out and they, they, are, they see all these areas where people need help. And you've seen it. You've gone to stores and you've seen people that, that need help or need services or need different types of rehabilitation. Um, or there's what we call the 2004 Crime Victims' Right Act. Or there's somebody that has been involved in a domestic violence um, case where law enforcement officers go out. And so they work for police departments in a civilian role and they contact victims of domestic violence. And because of the Victims' Right Act, they um, are offered services. Um, and so there's all these types of careers in the social services world. And so there's all these jobs out there. So if you're going, hey, I wanna be involved in the American criminal justice system, I just don't wanna be a cop. Believe me, there's a lot of services out there and careers out there available for you to get involved with. There's also um, jobs in what we call crime analysis, which is where you are looking at the data because in law enforcement, we're really getting a proactive role in trying to say, hey, what, what crimes occurred out there and how can we be involved in stopping that crime? And also records. A lot of people have to get the data for court. And so are, they're coming in and they wanna get that data. Or they wanna get those records. And so we need civilians to get those records. Also property clerks, when officers are taking the property and booking it into um, property or detectives need to take that property out for court, those property clerks are there. There's also 911 and dispatching communications that are civilians. So lots and lots of careers available. Also, you're going to see a question be asked of what's the difference between a crime scene um, investigation civilian and a commissioned sworn position. Well, let me tell you the difference. And I was actually really close to this because I was in a crime scene investigator. So when I was a police officer, um, I was in the problem solving unit. And I, um, once I was there for three years, there was an opening in our crime scene investigating unit. So I had to go over there and I did an oral board for it and interviewed. And then I had to go to an autopsy of a baby, which is hard um, because the supervisor of the unit knew that a lot of people, you have to go to autopsies and a lot of officers, it was difficult for them to do that. So she wanted to make sure we could do that. And so when I was over there, um, I loved it. And I probably would have stayed as a CSI for the rest of my career because the training we got was amazing. When I first went over there, I went through a 12 week academy to learn how to collect evidence and how to take photographs and process evidence. And then every probably four weeks that I got sent away sometimes out of the country to go and learn new techniques of processing evidence. It was just amazing. 
Um, and this was about the time that I wanted to make a difference and I started going into supervision. But anyhow, um, and then this will lead me into telling you what, what happened between the difference between commissioned and civilian CSIs. So in about 2007, 2008, we had the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And about this time was where mo a lot of the CSIs, not all, but a lot of the CSIs were commissioned, meaning that they were cops that were did like I did, that were cops first, and then they trained the cops how to be crime scene investigators. They went through academies like I did. And there were still civilians out there that were crime scene investigators, um, but not as many as did what I did, which were first cops and then got trained to be crime scene investigators. So after the financial crisis, we laid off a lot of cops and there weren't budgets to hire a bunch of new cops. So whenever CSIs would retire, they couldn't take cops off the street to go um, be CSIs. So they said, what are we gonna do? We need CSIs, but we can't take cops off the street. We need more cops on the street. So instead they knew that they had civilian CSIs. So they said, we're gonna take um, these positions that we have and instead of taking cops off the street and making CSIs um, commission CSIs, we're gonna start hiring more civilian CSIs. So right now it really is about 50-50. So whenever I get students that are interested in becoming crime scene investigators, I will tell them, you know, it's really up to you. You can go through and, and become a police officer and work for a department and then try to become, do it like I did where you then test to become a CSI or your other good chance is just be willing to travel and look for a job out there um, that hires civilians that are CSIs but be willing to go where they are hiring at the time. So that's what's really cool. All right, and then also be able to answer a question on the quiz is what's the difference between a crime scene investigator and a forensic technician? Well, the difference is, is your crime scene investigator is kind of like that picture shows. They go to the scene and they collect evidence and they do preliminary testing of the evidence. So they go to the crime scene, they take blood at the crime scene and they test it to tell if it's human blood or they test the fingerprints at the crime scene, they collect it, and they run the fingerprints at the crime scene. However, a forensic technician actually takes the blood that the crime scene investigator took at the crime scene and they run it. They never go to the crime scene, the forensic technician, because they're in the lab testing the DNA of the blood at the crime scene. So the forensic technician is the person who got their degree in chemistry and biology in the STEM um, area, and they are in the lab all the time doing the DNA testing. All right, um, one important case that you need to know and you will get tested on, you'll see it on a quiz, is Tennessee v. Garner. So Tennessee v. Garner came out in 1985. And prior to 1985, shooting at a fleeing suspect who refused to stop as commanded was common and legal. And so what happened, and what I mean by that, was after 1985, if an officer was called, somebody said, oh, somebody's inside my house, and an officer responded to a burglary call, and the officer responded and saw somebody at the house and they said, stop police. And the person ran away from him. That person cannot shoot at that suspect. Now, it doesn't mean that that person, that the officer can never shoot at the suspect. It just means, think of a time when the officer could still shoot at the suspect. Well, obviously if that suspect was an active shooter and that suspect was leaving the house and they were shooting at other people, harming other people, that would be the time that would happen. So Tennessee v. Garner was a very important case saying that officers were no longer could use deadly force to stop a fleeing suspect. So make sure if I ask you what Tennessee v. Garner is, that you understand what that case is. All right. That